Hi, hello everyone. So it's my great pleasure today to host this, this seminar by Dr. Thomas Graf. Uh, Thomas is a senior group leader at the Center for Genomic Regulation downtown in Barcelona. And as you might know, I've been working with him for seven years, so his visit is special for me. So along his career, Thomas has been always at the forefront of many uh, scientific advances in the fields of normal hematopoiesis, leukemia, and stem cells. For instance, during his early days as group leader at the University of Tübingen in Germany, his lab identified novel oncogenes involved in leukemia, such as MIP, ERP, or MAC, that then it was renamed as MIC. He also contributed to establish the concept of oncogene cooperativity by discovering that at least two oncogenes are needed to uh, get a leukemia. So then he moved to the EMBL as program coordinator, EMBL Heidelberg, where he got interested in the role of transcription factors in establishing lineage decisions. So let's say some transcription factors are important to establish a particular cell fate, whereas others are important for establishing another cell fate. So from the knowledge that he got with these kind of um, discoveries, he was able to determine later that particular transcription factors are able to change fates. So for instance, he discovered that the myelotranscription factor, CDP alpha, is capable of converting um, B cells into macrophages in a process that is 100% efficient. So it was the first 100% efficient transdifferentiation. So then he moved to the CRG. So he came here in Barcelona about 2008, I believe. And, um, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that uh, from the EMBL, he moved to the Albert Einstein in New York, where he established this first conversion system of uh, B2 macrophase transdifferentiation. Then he came to Barcelona and he kept interested in, in this kind of uh, role of transcription factor in extracting uh, lineage decisions, where he um, identified that CEP alpha is also able to convert leukemic um, B cells into non-tumorigenic macrophages and also to poise B cells for rapid and highly efficient reprogramming into induced pluripotent stem cells. That was in 2014. From that time, he uh, took advantage of these unique cellular tools to uncover the molecular mechanisms that are underlying this kind of cell fate conversions. And I think this is the topic of today's seminar so please, Thomas, whenever you want, we are looking forward to learn from you. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here uh, to see many of my old colleagues and friends and also some of the colleagues whose work I've followed for some years. Uh, and, of course, uh, there's many links between the work that we are doing on differentiation and, and the f formation of, of leukemia in particular. So let me start by uh, showing you my first slide. Um, now, let's see how that works. Yeah. So basically, the, the question that we have been interested in for, for the last uh, 20 years or so is, is how do stem or progenitor cells decide what to become? Uh, so what's the me molecular mechanisms of cell fate decisions? Um, and to introduce this topic, it's very useful to, to show the uh, famous epigenetic landscape uh, uh, formulated by Waddington, where a stem cell sits on top of a uh, of this uh, structure here, of this uh, mountain, uh, rolls down in the channels uh, and uh, at diff different bifurcation points, uh, it makes a decision to become one cell type or another um, through intermediates uh, reaching these different types of differentiated cells at the, at the, in these valleys at the bottom. And for a long time, it was thought that differentiation is an irreversible process that these uh, trajectories uh, are 
only go in one direction, but we know, uh, of course, since uh, uh, 2000, uh, since 1987, through the experiments of the lab from uh, Harold Weintraub, that transcription factors can induce the transdifferentiation from one cell type into another, and even more spectacular, the Yamanaka experiments where they converted fibroblasts back into pluripotent stem cells. And uh, just to summarize the, 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 the major findings here and the time scales, the transition to muscles, the Yamanaka experiments in 2006, and in between our own work on the transdifferentiation of blood cells. I will briefly talk uh, in one slide about our early findings that we con could convert <clears throat> myeloid cells into erythroid megakaryocytic cells. And uh, I want to show just one slide where I put the, the Waddington landscape for the hematopoietic system in the beach of Barcelona. Uh, and here you have the st hematopoietic stem cells. And what we showed is that you, we, we could convert avian myeloid precursors by overexpression of GATA1 into erythroid precursors and vice versa going back, uh, erythroid megakaryocyte precursors by overexpression of P1 into myeloid cells. And I'll come back to that at the very end of my talk very briefly. Uh, our main work actually has been in the last uh, 20 years or so on our discovery that a transcription factor called CP alpha very, as, as, as Jose mentioned, uh, uh, very efficiently converts B cells into macrophages. Um, and this is a transcription factor that is of the basic region leucine zipper type family uh, related to FOS and June. Uh, it's knockout, uh, knockout mice lack granulocyte macrophage progenitors, GMPs, and granulocytes, uh, but it has many roles uh, in, in, in a number of other tissues in adipocytes, hepatocytes, etc. cetera. Um, it, so let me just show you how we do these uh, cell transdifferentiation experiments. And we start uh, by making a construct where we fuse CP alpha with an estrogen receptor a binding domain uh, and a GFP as a, as a, uh, as a lineage uh, tracer. And we isolate B cells that are, that are positive for CD19 expression and negative for this cell surface antigen MAC1, CD11B. And these cells are infected with this construct and we just add beta estradiol and then we can follow by fax the conversion from the CD19 positive cells to Mark one positive cells. And in this experiment, this takes about uh, three to four days, uh, maybe four days with primary cells. Um, and you can show that, the, that there's a reciprocal silencing of the B cell program at the same time as the macrophage program is activated. And this can be visualized also at the level of, by RNA-seq, uh, at the level of uh, uh, genome-wide gene expression, and you can see the, uh, here is a time scale from zero, three hours, six hours, nine hours. Uh, you can see the gradual activation of macrophage genes. Uh, here are some examples. And the gradual silencing of B cell and cell cycle genes. Now, uh, the change, of course, from B cells to macrophages is dramatic. Uh, the cells become much larger, adherent, and most importantly, they become highly phagocytic, um, and they lose all the properties of the B cells. They, they no longer express uh, uh, immunoglobulins, although they keep the rearrangements of the, of the B cells. Um, and what I'm going to show you in a movie uh, is the conversion from B cells to macrophages uh, in, 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 in real time uh, using a cell line, a mouse cell line that we isolated that does this in a very short time scale, as you will see. And this movie was actually produced by, our, by, <laughs> by Jose Sardina, uh, who uh, 
made this very, I think, very impressive. Um, now let's see if I can, oops. Uh, yeah, here it is, okay. So what you see here is uh, in, in green are the, are the B cells and they are surrounded by, they are surrounded by the uh, red yeast. Why does it not work? It doesn't work. Okay, so what you see, maybe we can turn off the light. Um, the, the, the green cells are the, the, the green cells are B cells and in red candida albicans, and this is the t time uh, in in minutes, um, and you can see how uh, initially the B cells become highly motile. Then they start fusing, and in these uh, fused aggregates of B cells, which have turned into myeloid cells, they completely clean the plate uh, from, from uh, candida, so they become sterile. Uh, and this takes only uh, about two days, um, 50, 51 hours in this movie. So it's a really, really effective uh, process. And <clears throat> This allows then to study at the biochemical level what is, what is happening. And uh, of course, the transition involves the loss of a B cell regulatory network, um, which regulates all the <coughs> B cell markers um, to one which is specific for macrophages. And I've only shown here uh, that uh, CP alpha together with P1 is the key a module that regulates macrophage genes. And what is, uh, what I also would like to point out that there is one of these two uh, <coughs> uh, partners in this complex, namely P1, which is already expressed in B, cell, in B cells. And this will become very important for my talk later on. So what we have been studying is the mechanism of how B cells turn into macrophages. And we have studied in particular one aspect, namely the regulation of the speed of this process. How fast does it, does it work? Now, before I do that, uh, let me quickly say that uh, during this transdifferentiation from, from B cells to macrophages, uh, the cells actually uh, don't go completely direct from one cell type to another. They make this little loop via cells that are GMP-like uh, before they turn into macrophages. And of course, uh, <clears throat> what you see is the combination of p endogenous P1 with CP alpha, which generates first GMPs and then macrophages that have, again, uh, both of these transcription factors expressed. And this actually mimics what is seen during normal differentiation, where during the formation of GMPs, uh, endogenous CP alpha becomes activated, combines with P1, and generates these mature myeloid cells. Um, I also want to quickly show you that uh, in cells that do not express P1, we can induce macrophage-like cells. In this case, however, um, we, we need to combine uh, exogenous CP alpha with exogenous P1. And you can see here the increase in Mach1 expression uh, as the cells turn into macrophage-like cells. P1 alone has a weak effect, and CP alpha alone has no effect. Uh, I introduced this because this, I would show you an application of this uh, method later on. So uh, another, another thing which, which is important to know is that uh, part of the mechanism is that CP alpha binds to enhancers that are already primed by P1 and B cells. So uh, you can see this here. This is a, a time uh, scale uh, in cells that are induced for 10 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, uh, up to 48 hours in, in, in an inducible cell line. And you can see at this site, this is a chip, chip sequencing experiment, uh, CP alpha binds to a site which is already primed by P1. Um, and then there's another uh, mechanism where 
CP-alpha acts as a pioneer factor and it binds first to sites which later become occupied by P1. And the uh, expression of genes that are associated with the, these two types of enhancers uh, differs. Uh, the ones that are primed already start with some expression levels and then become uh, uh, much uh, enhanced. And the, the ones which enhancers which are activated by a pioneer mechanism start at much lower levels and then reach high levels. So here's the, now the, the main story that I want to talk about. It's not yet published. Uh, what we found is that a, a single point mutation in CP alpha uh, modulates the speed of B cell to macrophage transdifferentiation. And this uh, has helped us to illuminate how, how the process works. The whole story started uh, in a collabora collaboration with uh, Achim Lloyds, uh, an, an old uh, uh, postdoc of my, uh, my group uh, many years ago. Um, and he has been systematically mutating CP alpha, which the structure is shown here. Um, DNA binding domain, this is transcription factor domain, uh, to uh, mutate amino acids that can be post-translationally modified. And he kept sending these mutants to us and we tested them whether they have an effect on transdifferentiation. And uh, we found uh, a number of these mutants uh, have no effect, uh, but some of them did. And most of them actually had a uh, modification of functions which uh, led to a, a loss of function. This is what we expected with these three mutants uh, uh, conversions of three arginines into alanines at, the, at this uh, part of the transcriptional activation domain. Uh, but to our surprise, what we found is that in, in contrast to what we expected, we, see a, we saw a dramatic uh, acceleration of the transdifferentiation of the cells. And you can see this here by the, by the fax profiles. Here it takes about uh, three to four days for the cells to reach the macrophage state. And in this uh, triple mutant, it takes uh, two to three days. So it's dramatically accelerated. And so of course the question was, which of the arginines is the responsible one? And of the three arginines, uh, only this middle one, uh, arginine 35 is, is the one which, which shows this effect. And this is uh, shown here, this is red curve accelerated macrophage activation accelerated silencing of CD19. The resulting macrophages are fully functional. <clears throat> and uh, when we, when we uh, analyze the cells uh, by RNA-seq at different times after induction, zero hour, one hour, three hour, six hour, up to 120 hours, um, one can identify clusters like this one here uh, which is uh, uh, which has is associated with with uh, macrophage genes, where you can see that with the mutant uh, within one hour you can see the activation of these genes, whereas it takes about uh, eighteen hours for the wild type to activate these genes. And of course, this uh, this cluster correlates with uh, macrophage functions in G GDO analysis, and then there are there's another cluster where the opposite happens. Silencing is much faster with a mutant from activated genes in B cells to cells that, uh, to, to genes that become inactivated within one hour and a, a process which takes much longer with the wild type. And uh, here are the B cell genes and the associated GO terms. And you can also visualize this uh, difference by a PCA analysis. You can see that uh, the mutant cells uh, re reach uh, the state that the wild type cells stage within 18 hours, the mutant cells are already there within one hour. And then at, at the final type, time point, uh, the, the wild type and the mutant cells converge. <coughs> Give me a second. And this can be also uh, visualized uh, genome-wide uh, for the clusters of genes that become activated, two different clusters and a uh, cluster of genes that become inactivated. 
what you also notice here again is that the, the main differences in in the speed of transdifferentiation occurs within the first hour. Then it remains relatively constant, and then the wild type cells catch up. And just to show you individual examples uh, of key macrophage genes, uh, Mark one, this is the time course. The, the most traumatic differences are uh, within one hour. Lysozyme, colony stimulating factor uh, receptor uh, one. Um, CD14, and then for B cells, uh, CD19 down regulation is most traumatic within one hour. Pax5, RAC2, EBF1. So, what about uh, the mechanism uh, at, at the level of chromatin? Do the uh, wild type and mutant uh, CP alpha uh, affect chromatin changes in a, in a differential way? And for this, we did attack sequencing experiments at, at these different time points. And again, uh, as we saw before, there are clusters like this one here, uh, where the changes in chromatin accessibility uh, is low in, in B cells, and it, uh, it become, these sites become opened within one hour. Uh, and these are macrophage-enriched genes and uh, it's much, much slower with the wild type. And then there's another cluster down here where the silencing is accelerated uh, relative to the, to the wild type. And these are, of course, uh, uh, genes that are uh, sites that are associated uh, with B cell genes. These sites, uh, these uh, are attack uh, peaks, um, represent regulatory sites, most of them enhancers, but also promoters. Uh, and and uh, we, we, here we have simply looked at the closest genes to the sites that change. And here again, some examples. Um, here is the, actually the attack uh, sequencing kinetics. Uh, you can see the attack peaks. Uh, in this case, shown for uh, the Mach 1. Um, this is the promoter. This is the main enhancer, and you can see how much faster these attack peaks increase in size compared to the wild type. And here are the kinetics. And, and one, one thing which uh, is striking, and I, we don't really know the explanation, uh, the differences in chromatin accessibility are progressive. They become wider and wider between uh, the mutant and the wild type, whereas as you saw before, uh, for gene expression, uh, there's this very dramatic change early on, and then uh, the changes remain constant. So we don't know what, wh why there is this uh, disparity between chromatin opening and, and gene expression. Now, um, to show you examples for the silencing, uh, again, uh, you can see uh, this dramatic difference in the silencing with the mutant, which is much faster. Uh, there's another curious observation uh, that the silencing by the wild type uh, not only is slower, but there's, an, there's actually looks like the chromatin becomes uh, more open initially before it closes. Uh, and there's a recent paper by the global group that described a similar phenomenon for the silencing of the kit cell gene during erythroid differentiation. So it might be related to this phenomenon, but what it uh, means we don't really know yet. Now, <clears throat> we also looked at the motifs uh, under the gene regulatory sites that uh, are differ differentially regulated by the mutant and the wild type. And what we found uh, in the faster opening GREs, uh, many of the uh, basic region leucine zipper uh, proteins in, uh, which are enriched, and for the faster closing uh, genes, mostly uh, ETS family genes, but it was striking that P1 motif, which is shown here, was enriched in, in both of these motifs. And that immediately gave us the idea that maybe P1 is a, is a key factor that uh, makes the difference between how the mutant and the wild type works. And so we came up um, um, with, with uh, an experiment to test whether P1 is actually the, the, a key component in this process. And uh, we went back to this fibroblast to macrophage uh, transdifferentiation system that I've introduced before. 
um, which is summarized here, uh, and where we could find that actually, as we had hoped for, is that the activation of Mach 1 of the myeloid program uh, is much more dramatic uh, for, uh, for the mutant uh, CP alpha in combination with Mach 1 compared to the wild type uh, with, with P1. So, so, so even in this system, uh, P1 uh, seems to be playing a very important role. And uh, this immediately suggested that maybe P1 selectively speeds up the chromatin opening induced by CP alpha uh, mutant. To test this, we collaborated with the laboratory of Ken Zaret, who had developed uh, a method uh, which is called single molecule tracking, uh, where they can visualize uh, at the single molecule level the binding of CP alpha to chromatin. And just to introduce the experiment, the way uh, we did it is we used uh, uh, doxycycline inducible form of CP alpha fused to HALO, which allows to visualize CP alpha in live cells. And uh, these cells were split uh, somewhere, uh, uh, kept uh, uh, as a control, and, and the other half were super infected with P P1 to test whether P1 has an effect on chromatin binding of CP alpha. And of course, we did the, the same with the mutant uh, infected uh, cells, also fused to HALO. Uh, without and with P1, and then these cells were analyzed by a, high, a super resolution microscope uh, uh, after six hours after doxycycline induction of CP alpha in 24 hour induction of CP alpha. And what they can observe uh, is uh, that single particles, they can observe the radius of confinement and the average displacement uh, over a certain period of time of observation. So if the radius of confinement uh, is, is, uh, sorry, uh, is, is small, this indicates that the particle moves very little, bound to chromatin, moves very little, so it's in closed chromatin. And if the radius uh, of confinement is large, uh, it's, it's more in high, high motility chromatin. And then the other thing is also the average displacement, which is sort of a related parameter it's the distance between uh, particles uh, over a given time scale, which can be very short or very large. And applied uh, to calibrate the system, they, they first looked at histone 2B halo cells. Uh, so you can, you can measure the distribution uh, of the average displacement and the average radius of confinement. And not surprisingly, of course, the low mobility chromatin is in this region down here. These are individual particles, 20,000 per cell. And this is the high mobility chromatin. And now you can, now uh, they applied uh, this calibration to their real experiments. And if you look closely, you might see the differences. So what you see here is the CP alpha uh, halo minus P1 plus P1. And P1 has an effect, uh, this is six hours after induction. You can see that this, this part of the low mo mobility chromatin is weaker, but the effect is much more dramatic with the mutant. It sort of completely disappears. Uh, instead, there is an increase in high mobility chromatin as shown with this green arrow, which is a little bit hard to see here. Um, the effects are essentially uh, stabilized, actually almost not visible anymore, these differences between wild type and mutant at the later time point. So the effects are mostly at the very early time point. And this is quantified here. Uh, I really uh, will not go in, into the details, but the, the differences are very, very dramatic. Um, uh, just to show you quickly here, uh, this is wild type CP alpha plus minus P1, the differences are minor, and the mutant, uh, uh, minus P1 and plus P1, uh, the low mobility chromatin are very dramatic. And this is very dramatic early on and much less dramatic at the 24 hour time point. So let's go back to 
the B cells uh, and, and <clears throat> what might be happening here. Um, and um, we came up with the idea that actually uh, P1 might be uh, playing a role sort of as a, uh, a link between B cells and macrophages uh, in that it may be uh, differentially uh, removed by P1 from the B cell regulatory sites uh, and in a way sort of relocated uh, by a theft mechanism to macrophage gene regulatory elements. So that in macrophages, uh, uh, the B cell genes are of course uh, downregulated because this element uh, has collapsed and th the macrophage uh, uh, specific GREs become activated and, and this leads to the macrophage gene upregulation. So the question was whether uh, this model is correct and, and if so, uh, then it would predict that uh, it would predict that the mutant CP alpha not only preferentially interacts with P1, uh, but also it is better at relocating the uh, P1 from B cell GREs to macrophage GREs. Now I can tell you that our data that you will see from now on actually very strongly support this model. Um, this is really the, 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 the main mechanism, this theft mechanism, which is accelerated by the mutant. So let me go quickly into the data. Uh, the first thing which we did is to look at the interaction of mutant uh, CP alpha uh, with other proteins uh, in B cells that where we have activated the mutant. And uh, what we have compared here uh, and we have done a mass spec analysis in collaboration with, with Achim Lloyds uh, using a technique which is called BioID, uh, which I won't go into detail, but it's, a, it's, it's probably the, the most sophisticated mass spec analysis to identify specific interactors. And what we found comparing the proteins that spe specifically interact with the mutant on, on, on this axis and uh, the wild type uh, on this axis, uh, the wild type on this axis, is that uh, P1 was the single most differentially interacting protein that interacts with the mutant and much less with the wild type. Um, and uh, there were two others uh, which, which are, however, the, the interaction is, is not significant. Um, what you can also see is that there is a slight uh, skewing of most of the uh, interactors towards the wild type side. And this is because the, the wild type is actually expressed at highly, uh, slightly higher levels than the mutant. And this is important because one of the obvious mechanism that we initially thought is that the mutant uh, protein is simply stabilized and therefore more active but that's not the case. It's expressed at slightly lower levels. So uh, we also uh, studied the interaction between CP alpha and PU1 uh, in live cells, which, which was a proximity ligation assay. I, I won't go into details how this works. Uh, uh, basically you detect the proximity of antibodies of, uh, against CP alpha and PU1. You can visualize them as dots in the cells and what we saw is that there is uh, a higher interaction between the mutant and P1 with this assay. So um, what other experiments can we do to, to test the theft hypothesis? And so here what we did is we performed CP alpha P1 chip experiments with B cells that were induced for three hours to activate either wild type or mutant CP alpha. And these experiments are a little bit complicated, so I'll, I'll go through slowly. And, and if somebody doesn't understand them, you're very welcome to interrupt me and, and, and ask me. So let me just <clears throat> introduce how we did this. Um, we did this genome-wide, but luckily uh, by inspecting the genome, I found a region that a, a two, 270 KB region, which contains a B cell gene 
and a macrophage gene. And this allows us to visualize the differential effects on these two types of genes and their regulatory regions. Um, now, uh, let me show you the, the expression, gene expression differences of this BCL gene uh, for the mutant uh, and for the wild type. So remember that what we saw before. So the, the mutant is much uh, more efficient in silencing this BCL gene than the wild type. And conversely, uh, the, this ma macrophage gene that I've never heard before uh, is also activated much more rapidly by the mutant than by the wild type. Now, if we do the, uh, if we look at the binding of PU1 in B cells, and this is from published data, uh, what, we've, what we found is that there are four sites that are specifically bound in B cells, which we call uh, B cell GREs, which are not bound uh, by P1 in macrophages, or much less See these four sites here in red. And then if we look at the sites that are bound by CP alpha in macrophages, CP alpha is not expressed in B cells, so CP alpha in macrophages, we see that it doesn't bind to the B cell GREs, but it binds uh, to the macrophage GREs. And so now we can use our experimental data and look what happens when we overexpress wild type and mutant CP alpha, uh, and, and we, we look at this locus. And so we first look at P1, and you can see that P1 is bound much more uh, in the wild type cells at these four B cell GREs than the mutant. The mutant is basically doesn't bind there anymore. And the, the idea is that it has been already translocated, relocated to the macrophage GREs, which are occupied by, by the mutant, and also to a slightly lower extent by the wild type. And very similar results uh, can be seen when we look at the CP alpha binding profiles. The wild type is bound to the B cell GREs uh, and to a much lesser extent to the myeloid GREs, uh, whereas the mutant uh, CP alpha uh, is still a little bit bound at the, at the myeloid GREs, but mostly uh, bound at the, at the myeloid GREs. So the, so the idea is that uh, the CP alpha at three hours, uh, the wild type is still uh, binding to these uh, GREs that needs to be silenced, uh, whereas the mutant has already done its job and has translocated uh, the, the, the P, uh, P1 um, from, from these sites to the, to the myeloid sites. And um, this can also be uh, visualized in a more dynamic manner. Um, and of course, this is a snapshot in time. But what we have is we have this uh, dynamic attack sequencing data. So we can superimpose, integrate these data with the attack data. And here are the kinetics of the attack peaks at these different sites, uh, which I call here enhancers. Um, and you can see the differences uh, already by eye, but it's a little bit hard to see by eye. Uh, when we quantify them, you can see uh, the expected differences in chromatin uh, closing and in chromatin opening, which are faster uh, by the mutants. Now, <clears throat> we have also done this uh, analysis genome-wide, and I won't go into, into any detail, just to say uh, we have simply looked for sites genome-wide that are bound less by P1 in CP alpha uh, mutant cells. And we can, we can see as expected that these sites uh, show an accelerated silencing uh, of chromatin closing in this case and uh, compared to the mutant. And sites that are bound more by P1 uh, show an accelerated uh, opening. So these data and, and, and many more data strongly su uh, support this, uh, the, the, the theft model. I also want to point out that the findings that we made uh, 
can be seen in a different way, um, namely that P1 acts sort of as a relay between these two cell types, uh, which can be in an on position for B cell genes or in an on position for macrophage genes. And that CP alpha that comes in the switch that pushes this relay into the other position. And this is a mechanism where P1 couples the two gene expression programs and that during transdifferentiation you generate the faithful, uh, the, novo, uh, the novo expression of the macrophage gene regulatory network. Because of course, uh, if, if, if these two things are not coordinated, you might get cells where the uh, cells express the macrophage program, but they haven't silenced the, the B cell program. Of course, this would not be a real macrophage. This would be a confused cells. Right? But this doesn't happen during transdifferentiation. And so we believe that the reason why this doesn't happen is that because through this mechanism where P1 acts as a relay, uh, these two processes are, are coupled. So uh, to the last part of my talk, what enzyme methylates arginine 35? It of the different types of uh, arginine methylases uh, uh, that induce asymmetric dimethylation, which we knew was, was uh, the, the, the type of methylation of arginine 35. Only one of these enzymes, PRMT4 or CAM1, uh, does the job. Um, and it's very specifically, if, we, if, we, uh, if, if uh, they do an analysis of peptides where they take CP alpha apart so that the 20 arginines of CP alpha are in different peptides, the only peptide that becomes uh, methylated with CARM1 is this one which contains 35A, 35, arginine 35, which is really surprising because, uh, you know, it's a, single, it's a single amino acid that has such a dramatic effect. Um, a prediction of if CARM1 is the key enzyme is that you, you should be able to, by gain of function and loss of function experiments, to modulate the speed of transdifferentiation. And for this, we use the, the human B cell leukemia model, uh, where we either uh, overexpress CARM1, and this leads to a, a, to a decrease in the speed of macrophage upregulation and the down, down regulation of CD19. So it's, it slows down the process. And if we inhibit CARM1, then it activates the process. And we believe this uh, is because it, of course, it leads to the, uh, to the methylation and uh, unmethylation of this critical uh, R35A resi residue in, in CARM1. The other prediction, if it's really only R35, is that th these perturbation experiments with CARM1, they should not work anymore in the background of the mutant cells. And this is exactly what we found. So if you, if you use uh, these uh, human B cell uh, uh, cells that can be induced to transdifferentiate now uh, with with the with the mutant, then the CAM1 perturbation have not, no longer have an effect because it, it cannot this residue cannot be methylated. Okay, so uh, let me then summarize this um, the sequential steps during. B cell to uh, macrophage transdifferentiation. So the first thing that happens, CP alpha comes in, um, then uh, gets methylated uh, when it's wild type, uh, bound, it becomes, uh, P1 becomes, uh, uh, sorry, it's bound to uh, P1, which, which is already occupying uh, the B cell GREs uh, on chromatin. Um, and the P1 then becomes translocated um, to the macrophage GREs. Um, and of course, during this process, uh, the silencing of the B cell uh, genes uh, occur and activation of macrophage, macrophage genes occur in this intermediate stage. And then in the end stage, there's a complete silencing of the B cell genes and a strong activation of macrophage genes. And 
the mutant does exactly the same um, in its unmethylated form, uh, except that, uh, or if carbon one is inhibited, uh, in, uh, except that it, it, it is, does everything much faster, and it is because it has a higher affinity for P1, and that's the rate limiting step, which makes all other subsequent steps faster. So this translocation is faster, and the opening of myeloid GREs is faster, and expression, gene expression is faster. So the very final point of my talk is, um, does CARM1 activity influence the directionality of a cell fate, cell fate decision? So far I've only talked about speed, but what about in normal differentiation processes where you have a binary decision to make, a bifurcation? And so we have uh, examined this by <coughs> uh, looking at uh, GMPs, granulocyte macrophage precursor, that, be, ca that can become either granulocytes or monocytes. Um, and we have first looked at the level of active CARM1 in these cells. Um, and what we found uh, is that the level are highest in GMPs than there are uh, intermediate in granulocytes and are lowest in monocytes. And this we did uh, measuring uh, the levels of uh, asymmetrically de demethylated buff 155 as a substrate of CARM1. Uh, and so, so this would fit with the idea that uh, low levels of CARM1 uh, should bias GMPs to differentiate into monocytes and higher levels of GMPs maybe uh, biases the cells towards granulocytes. For this, to test this, we did colony forming assays with GMPs and looked at the distribution of the colonies uh, with different concentrations of this CARM1 inhibitor TP064. <clears throat> and what we see is exactly what we had hoped for, namely an increase in the number of monocyte colonies uh, at the highest concentrations. Uh, with the concomitant decrease of the granulocyte colonies. Uh, so uh, the low levels of CARM1 bias the cells towards monocytes. Uh, and we believe this is because it also increases the speed of monocyte formation. Now, uh, what about uh, the literature? So there are other described CARM1 controlled cell fate decisions uh, during lineage bifurcations. The most famous one is in early embryo development, uh, where CAM1 is, has been shown to be absolutely required for early embryo development. Um, the candidates that have been uh, suggested are specifically uh, methylated arginine uh, in a histone, but we actually suspect it, it's actually a transcription factor that is the key target. In muscle, uh, uh, it has been shown that the, RG, the methylation of PAX7 uh, uh, is a key event in muscle differentiation for muscle satellite stem cells. Then CAM1 has been also shown to be important for the formation of MLL AF9 induced leukemia. Uh, without CAM1, you do not get uh, leukemia. And I think that's very interesting because in another study by Bo Porce, uh, they have shown that MLF9 uh, leukemia requires CP alpha. So it is possible that the target of CAM1 in, in these experiments by the NIMA lab is, which they didn't know, uh, could be CP alpha itself, playing a key role uh, also in cancer. And finally, there is a recent paper where CAM1 plays a role in the specification of dendritic cell subsets. So uh, let me then give you a more final, broader view. Um, in, the, in the early studies that I did uh, with, with the conversion from erythroid cells to myeloid cells and vice versa, uh, we've, we found that the relative levels of these two transcription factors are key to decide whether the cells go in one direction or another. Um, but what we found here now is a, is a different mechanism. 
that one and the same transcription factor can exist in two forms that have different activities. And the relative proportions of these two forms decide in which cell, in which direction a cell differentiates. So in our case, methylated towards granulocytes, methylated CB alpha towards granulocytes, and unmethylated, uh, this should be unmethylated uh, CB alpha, sorry, unmethylated CB alpha should bias the cells towards um, the other way around, sorry, towards macrophages. Um, so I think we can do without this. And I would like to thank the people who did the work. Um, um, uh, a lot of the work, um, uh, PM uh, Torcal Garcia uh, did uh, a very large part of the work, Tian Tian, uh, who is now at Valdebron, uh, and in my group, uh, bioinformatician Antonis Klonisakis and uh, technician Marisa de Andres. Uh, and then we have collaborated with the groups of Ken Zaret and, and Achim Leutz. And, and of course, many people have participated in. Uh, from my group in, in, in this study, which has been going on for the last six or seven years. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Really, really nice work. So let's open the Q&A session. Uh, let's start with Thomas. Thank you very much, Thomas, for the great talk. So uh, I like this concept of the um, confused cells, these intermediate st state cells, because now for single cell proteomics, we're starting to see cells that share myeloid and B cell markers sometimes. So do you think that they really exist and the cells are happening there? And what are, these are intermediate states or they have their own functions, the cells there? So we're starting to see some populations at the single cell that they have intermediate markers of B cells and myeloid cells, a few yeah. populations. Um, I mean, the, the, the intermediates... Uh, these are in, in the context of leukemia, of course, these are aberrant cells, these are not normals. Yeah, but are they, are they stable or are they intermediates? Because, of course, uh, in, in this transition, uh, you do have cells that express mixed markers, right? It's actually a hallmark. If you see intermediates that express both at the same time, you know it's transdifferentiation, it's not selection. Mm -hmm. uh, we've used it early on as a, as a, as a, as a, as a key criteria. Yeah. So this is a fixed point, we don't know. This is, this is leukemias, bone marrow leukemia, and, and, and there you see the cells with a few cell types yeah. that they have both type of markers. Yeah. I mean, of course, there's many mechanisms that, that in, 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 in these uh, leukemic cells often have accumulated many different mutations, so there are probably uh, mechanisms that, that work against each other or in parallel that can create these uh, aberrant phenotypes, which could, could be stable. I mean, it, it's quite possible. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Really nice talk. Um, I have a question regarding your model. So if I understand well, um, you assume that the methylation in the arginine is going to interfere with the binding between uh, CBB alpha and uh, Q1, right? Physically. So it's going to be a, st a, st a, a sterical effect. Did you check that? So would you consider the possibility maybe that uh, there would be a third factor kind of a reader of the methylation mark that could be kind of controlling the binding between both? Because usually at the, at the methylation, in a, like in arginine, I mean, this is a kind of big, uh, and unless there is a specific, mm, very, very precise effect in the structure, I would expect maybe to even block complete the interactions. So. Uh, so the question is whether there are in this interaction between CP alpha and P1, other proteins involved that so, regulate. So you could explain the model by, mm -hmm. the, because you, you mentioned when the mass spec, no? That is clearly when you do the, the interactome uh, in the mutant, you only see P1 clearly there. But it's possible in the wild type there is a third factor that is a reader of this demethylation mark. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's certainly possible. I, I have to point out there's something really intriguing about the, the site of the mutation. It's not in a structured domain, it's in the IDR, in the intrinsically disordered domain, way down in the transcription factor activation domain, which has no structure. Um, and Maybe it's, it's not support. clear how these two proteins interact. So one possibility is that the methylation of this arginine creates a local structure okay. that allows the the protein to interact more strongly with P1. Mm -hmm. And this structure is, is much less formed in the wild type. But I don't know, it could also be, you know, IDRs immediately, uh, if, you, if you are into this field, condensate formation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's possible that these interactions are very weak. Um, they're not the classical protein interactions by hydrophobicity or something. By, by the way, we have also uh, replaced the, the arginine uh, with lysine uh, which is a, another charged amino acid, and, it, and it's still accelerated. So it's 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 really the the the, the methylation, um, but you know it could be uh, other mechanisms which which we we really don't understand at all. So I was just asking only because it could explain somehow, uh, not as a stochastic thing, you know, like the binding between P1 and CP alpha, but maybe something regulated that you are really removing by uh, mutating this arginine. It's just a, an idea. That was a, kind of a, an alternative explanation. No? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, a bit related with what Alec was saying, maybe there's a demethylase that you could think of that could uh, remove this methylated site that exists in the cell and can, can create. Can you speak a little bit louder? that maybe you can think it's a bit related to what Alex was saying, maybe you can think of other methylates that could uh, remove the methylated site of this arginine within the cell. Yeah, so the, if there are known arginine demethylases, to be honest, I don't know. I don't, I don't know whether they have been described, but it could be, I don't know. Does anybody know this? Alex? No. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, really fascinating. i just wondering if there is uh, any uh, report about the, it's the, any possibility that in the GMPs or myeloid progenitors to relocate P1 to the B cell enhancer uh, locus in the inverse way. I don't know if there is that some factor. Or yeah. So, so can you can you go back from myeloid cells to B cells? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we have tried for some years <laughs> to achieve that, and we were never able to do that. Uh, and it's not so clear why. I mean, we have always, of course, if an experiment doesn't work, you, you it doesn't mean it. You, you have done it the, the proper way. Uh, our hand-waving explanation has always been that uh, lymphoid, cells have, lymphoid cells have more complex regulatory networks. They involve more transcription factors. Um, and this could be because they arrived later in evolution. So the ancestral uh, hematopoietic cell was probably a macrophage. Uh, there was a, actually uh, also a recent paper in blood, I don't know if you have seen it, uh, where they claim that, you know, they, they can trace it back to, <laughs> to the earliest uh, metazoans. Um, and, and, and that the key thing is to repress the myeloid program to allow other lineages to arise like erythroid and especially lymphoid. And, and so it has a lot more repressive controls. If you, if you eliminate Pax5, you eliminate EBF1, singly, you will activate the myeloid program. Uh, you will de-repress it. So they, they have to be all the time working to keep down the desire of the cell to become a macrophage. That's how I see it. And so to re re-establish this repressive system in macrophage is much more difficult. The other thing which makes it more difficult, macrophages typically are non-dividing cells. So, so to, you also have to activate 
a mechanism by which they, they acquire the ability to, to divide like B cells do. Um, so we have not been able to do it. Um, and I don't know if this, I don't think there's any uh, transition of this type described in the literature. So we have some questions from the online audience. So amazing talk, Thomas, uh, a couple of questions. Do these B cell to macrophage transdifferentiated cells divide during the, this conversion process? I'll do these questions one by one. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they typically, they divide once in average, uh, but we know that uh, if you inhibit, if we inhibit division, they, they can still do it. So actually, um, we believe that that uh, cell division is not required. In fact, it might be counteractive. Um, and CP alpha is a very strong inducer of cell cycle inhibition. So it, it, these processes are probably coupled. So so it, it, I think this, this, this was the question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So second question, do you see any clinical application of this system, especially in transdifferentiation cases such as BLL that transdifferentiate to histocytic sarcoma? Um, do I see a, a, a translational application? Uh, before, I, about the histocytic sarcoma, I, I, I really cannot say anything. It's, I, I, I just am not in this field. But, but I do see potential clinical applications, which we have actually pursued for a while to find um, activators of endogenous CP alpha in leukemic cells, um, small compounds that de-repress CP alpha and, and that CP alpha when activated would switch the cells to a Macrophage. We have shown, as you mentioned in, my, in your introduction, Jose, uh, we have shown before that these leukemic uh, B cells, uh, when transdifferentiated by CP alpha into macrophages, they become non tumorigenic. It's so efficient that they become non tumorigenic. And so it would be an alternative way to uh, alternative therapy. Um, th that's one thing. The, the other thing which, which I know uh, other people are pursuing is to apply this transdifferentiation to generate uh, 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 dendritic cells that can be used uh, as a combination of CP alpha or other transcription factors into dendritic cells that are important for vaccine development. Uh, and, and, and I know of a, yet another approach is, is, is to uh, make the cells more susceptible to, to immune attack through uh, transdifferentiation. Good. So last question, I don't know if this question is for you or for me, because it says, does CBP alpha have an effect in DNA methylation directly where it binds? So is CBP alpha binding to the DNA able to induce DNA demethylation? Huh. I should ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, I mean, actually, you, you have shown it. I mean, uh, this is part of the this very complex process of, of lineage conversions. I mean, you, you, whatever you study, something is happening, and, and, and demethylation is, is, is part of it. So what, what Hosse showed is that uh, CP alpha can actually, um, at certain sites where it binds, recruit TET2 and TET2 is, is the initiating enzymes in the, in the cascade that leads to DNA methylation, demethylation. Uh, so so it, it, yes, it's probably part of this. What would be interesting to see is whether the mutant uh, does this much more rapidly and efficiently. I would predict yes, because it's downstream. Good, so yeah. <laughs> That was very, it was very interesting. Um, my question is uh, perhaps linked to this. Uh, I didn't quite understand why CBP alpha binding to uh, P1 um, changed the location of the, of the, the GREs that are bound. Sorry, why? Why uh, the GREs that are bound by uh, CBP alpha and P1 change from in the beginning 
uh, going from the macrophage ones, uh, going yeah. from the B cell ones to the macrophage ones. Why, why does the binding specificity change of P1? Yes, the location. Yeah. Oh, that's a fantastic question. I mean, uh, we would like to know that. Um, it could be that that the complex between CP alpha and P1 cause a, a conformational change of P1 so that it alters the, the binding specificity somehow. Um, there's no evidence for that, but, but, but that would be one possibility. Of course, uh, this, I mean, what, what we are seeing here, we are scraping the, the tip of the iceberg. There's probably many other factors involved. Uh, we also know that for mild specification, other factors uh, have been described to be important. IRF8, for example, um, they all may play a role, um, which may result in complexes that together uh, then create a different specificity of one of their components. But, but no, we don't really know um, what makes P1 uh, not like B cell GREs anymore when it is together with CP alpha. And I, I guess you have already looked at the motifs, and there are no motifs that uh, differentiate the two types of GREs. Uh, you know, as I was saying it, uh, I was thinking about it. I, I don't really know. I have to talk to my bioinformatician whether he has looked closely enough, whether uh, whether there can be seen differences in the motifs as possible. I don't know. Okay, thanks. I think for, for a sake of time, we should stop here. Thank you so much.